Hello everyone. Today we're going to begin our exploration of a few of the interesting passages in Locke's essay concerning human understanding. You will have noticed by now that he has an extensive introduction which uh, focuses primarily on this notion of innate ideas. This was something that we saw was shared by an idea that was shared by all of the rationalist philosophers that we've read up to this point, and indeed introduced by Descartes. This is the notion that there are ideas uh, a priori uh, wedded to the very fabric of reason itself that we can rationally examine, ideas that in some ways are self-evident and from which we can derive uh, understanding about the nature of the world and ourselves. So we saw that, uh, you recall that Descartes illustrated this with the example of the block of wax that he takes and places close to the fire, in which all the sensible properties over time change, and nevertheless we understand it as the same thing. Something that Descartes associates with the concept of, an ex of extension, okay? one of his three innate ideas. Descartes, you'll recall, uh, singles out three fundamental ideas that he calls innate. They're somehow imprinted in our minds themselves. Okay? One is extension. Okay? At the root of all of our understanding of mathematics and quantity and space. Okay? Uh, the second is uh, the idea of the self or the soul. And the third is the idea of God. Locke rejects altogether the proposition that there are innate ideas. His favorite metaphor is that of an empty room. The mind, in his view, starts out as empty space at birth. Through the stimulation, through the five senses that we have, the world outside of us begins to fill that empty room with furniture, and we build up our knowledge from there. This is why he starts out at the beginning with such an extensive examination of this notion of innate ideas. Locke tells us at the beginning of his introduction that one of his goals is to search out the bonds between opinion and knowledge, examine by what measures in things where we have certain knowledge, we have to regulate our assent and moderate our persuasion. So he tells us right at the very beginning that we can examine, understand something about the limits of our knowledge, which is going to inform how we investigate the world around us, how we understand ourselves in the world. This contrasts with the very optimistic uh, idea of the progress of knowledge that comes with the uh, notion of innate ideas among, in the rationalists. Okay. We saw that for all of the rationalists, they saw a promise of an unlimited expanse of knowledge, right, an, a, an ability ultimately to be able to understand any type of question that the human mind might have, and to be able to solve those all on the basis of some kind of calculation. Therefore, Locke explains his method as being comprised of three fundamental parts. First, he's going to begin to, by looking at the origin of ideas, any, everything that comes into our conscious awareness, where this comes from and how we have those. Secondly, he's going to attempt to show uh, what sort of certainty evidence and extent of understanding comes from those ideas. You'll recall that Descartes wanted to count as knowledge only things that we know th uh, with absolute certainty. Anything that is subject to some kind of evidence that is not 100% certain, that doesn't have the same precision and rigor as we would expect from a mathematical proof, is not going to count as knowledge. And furthermore, we saw that Descartes and the other rationalists with him thought that this type of knowledge could ultimately extend well beyond uh, mathematics. 
into indeed all areas of human knowledge. We see that Locke is announcing at the very outset when he describes his method that he's going to think he's going to tell us that different types of knowledge don't necessarily have the same degree of certainty or the same degree of evidence. The third thing that Locke is going to try to do is to make inquiry into the nature and grounds of faith or opinion whereby I mean that assent which we give to any proposition as true of whose truth we have yet no certain knowledge. So there are degrees of evidence, degrees of assent. Some opinions are better founded than others. Uh, and uh, there is very little that's going to admit of total certainty uh, in the rationalist style. This is why Locke wants to begin with such a thorough and extensive examination of innate ideas. Now, as you read this section on innate ideas and Locke's refutation of the idea of innate ideas, you want to give some attention to thinking about how uh, persuasive or unpersuasive his arguments are. But all of his arguments, uh, even though he's quite expansive on this, in many ways boil down to his first argument, which is based on universal assent. So Locke thinks that it stands to reason that if there were ideas that were uh, molded into the very fabric of the human mind, that were imprinted innately in our mind, then everybody the world over in all cultures and all ages should know those be clear about them, and automatically assent to them. I'll leave you to figure out for yourselves, which should be fairly easy, what the rationalist would respond, how the rationalist would respond to, to that argument of, of Locke's. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the fund, fund, fundamental objection that Locke raises, that uh, if we look the world over, in fact, we see that there are no notions whatsoever that people everywhere and at all times uh, automatically agree to, nothing that is self-evident to everyone. Even those very fundamental propositions of logic and reasoning, things like the law of non-contradiction, the claim that the same thing cannot both be true and not true of the same subject at the same time and in the same respect, even such fundamental logical laws like that, which we might argue are somehow self-evident, notice that Locke points out that it may not be self-evident to someone until it's pointed out to them, until someone raises it and uh, explains it, which he takes also as grounds for saying that this too is not something that we can fundamentally be cons considered to be innate. So where do ideas come from? Well, since there's nothing innate, okay, that means that that mental room is empty at the start, okay, and everything has to come into it from the outside. So it comes through the five senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch. Ideas flow in, they're retained through our memory, we can compare and contrast them, we can assign names to them and develop language. As we compare and contrast them, we can begin to abstract from them, develop general ideas, and build up knowledge on the basis of this experience. So Locke starts out with this rejection of innate ideas. Next time, we will look into more detail at what he says these ideas are that we do gather in our mind through observation and experience.